get, get in the big they um they said that the city had escaped major damage even as other areas the non-tourist areas of the cities were being inundated by floodwaters even as the levees remained breached those rescue efforts were halted. They were suspended because of alleged violence by Black New Orleanians. Rumors that were proved to be false, largely exaggerated, but it left tens of thousands of people unprotected from the rising floodwaters. And the failure by so many to corroborate or the Right, the failure of them to corroborate these allegations reinforced the tourist geography again, which steers tourists from um, certain areas of the city, discouraging access to Black neighborhoods that are automatically presumed to be risky, unsafe, or violent. Another thing was that local, state, national public officials and media collaborated in the tourist promotion of debauchery and degradation as the most predominant and enduring features of Black New Orleans during that period. I mean, we really witnessed the criminalization of Black New Orleans with African-Americans who were treated time and time again, not as victims, but as enemy combatants. We saw it in the Superdome, in that convention center on the Danziger Bridge, um, as people tried to escape New Orleans to get into to Gretna. And then we saw it and continue to see it in the uneven and inequitable recovery process. The road home, the racially discriminatory allocation of resources, the wholesale demolition of public housing without any alternative um, affordable options to replace it, pushing more and more people into more vulnerable areas of the, the city, the rise in homelessness, the even widening gap of racialized wealth and income inequality. So in my research, I traced the roots of that inequality and the legacy of slavery in New Orleans tourist industry and really look at two intersecting frames to think about that, desire and disaster. And I'm showing um, just a couple of images that I'm sure many of you find familiar, the way that, that Black people and Black culture is put front and center to market New Orleans uh, tourist image. And tourists are encouraged to think that they are experiencing and celebrating Black culture by eating Creole cuisine and dancing. The thinking of black um, the black city and associating it with crime and immorality and educational inadequacy, political corruption, all of those things. So we have a paradox, the paradoxical construction of Blackness that acknowledges and celebrates Black cultural contributions while simultaneously insisting on Black social inferiority. And that has facilitated the continuance of Black subjugation as the appropriation of Black labor and the denial of Black history and agency. 
even as they highlighted the city's Black cultural contributions and appeal to Black residents and visitors. So you've got a sneak preview just now of my next slide. But these are some of the ways that we see how the white supremacist memory of slavery and Black culture and how it views the Old South with a sense of loss and nostalgia. In the tourist narrative that I studied, I saw the way that it limited its historical focus to the colonial and antebellum periods, focusing almost exclusively on the purportedly exceptional race relations that distinguished New Orleans from the rest of the slaveholding South, presenting New Orleans as benefiting from the most liberal and refined elements of Southern culture while avoiding its most brutal, inhumane, and inegalitarian features, presenting the city as racially exceptional that was not sullied by racial tension and conflict that affected other Southern cities, repeating the narrative of racial harmony and equality, and we see these racial fictions being exemplified by the modernizing of slave quarters into trendy restaurants and hotels and tourist sites, as these advertisements of Nottoway and Oak Alley plantations show, one inviting you to relive, relax, and savor the antebellum period in Oak Alley, presenting the romance, history, and beauty of a bygone era. We also see the legacy of slavery in the proliferation of stereotypical images and merchandise on display in tourist shops. And these next slides are just photographs I took before Katrina in French Quarter tourist shops. The very um, omnipresence of African-American service workers whose performance of happy servitudes in many ways is mandated by the conventions of the local tourist economy. So that tourists are encouraged to consume or gaze upon Black culture without the uncomfortable acknowledgement of an exploitative slave system or the persistent legacy of racial and class inequality. New Orleans tourists then become acquainted with a representation of Blackness that leaves the actual Black New Orleans invisible. And I discovered this early on when I came across a couple of dolls produced by a local company in New Orleans, Gambina. And they really, for me, epitomized the paradox that I was talking about. These are photos of the dolls and you can see they both have a little card with the description and the name. The first one on the left is Cleo, market lady. And her description says, traditionally, this lady held an honored position in the Southern household. Her duties were to keep the house running smoothly by overseeing the house servants and attending to errands, especially marketing. Because of her high station, she was respected by the other servants and loved by the family she served. The next doll is Emma, circa 1850. And her description says, Harvest time from the earliest days of settlement to the mid 1900s brought family and friends together and the whole community would work side by side to bring in their crops. Cotton was ready for the mills in the summer and the children would help too. Many festivals and country fairs evolved from this type of community effort. In the cotton fields, everyone would grab a sack and sing and carry on lively conversations as they walked through the rows of cotton filling their sacks. Emma represents a woman of this era and wears a typical dress and carries a sack of cotton by her side. So I can't hear you, but I'm imagining that some of you may have gasped aloud to hear those descriptions describing slavery as something akin to a community festival. So these Gambina servant dolls, and even the description of them as servant dolls, does epitomize that paradox that I referred to earlier. They glamorize the history of slavery and celebrate the contributions and dignity of African-Americans whose labor and cultural innovations are credited with shaping a distinctive New Orleans way of life. In this way, the dolls present a troubling romantic memory of slavery that entirely avoids addressing issues of power or justice. 
But I would be remiss if I talked to you in this presentation and gave you the impression that it's only about representation or the images that appear in these figurines and the dolls. It's not just about representation, it's about resources. And if we think about the French Quarter, it's retained its symbolic significance in the city. And after Katrina, it benefited disproportionately from resources dedicated to rebuilding efforts. The contrast between the revitalized French Quarter and the devastated neighborhoods in the Lower Ninth Ward and New Orleans East in Gentilly has been staggering. And New Orleans residents know that they recognize that the federal government has not fixed everything for everybody. This image was um, a little graffiti on the side of a bar room in New Orleans East that I took. But if we look at some of the images um, from 2007 all the way to 2013. But you know, some of these neighborhoods don't look much different than this. These are images from the Lower Ninth Ward. So clearly beyond the refurbished and newly created tourist zones, many neighborhoods continue to languish from an incomplete and uneven recovery that is reflected in the challenges of persistent environmental vulnerability, a dearth of affordable housing, a corrupt and ineffective criminal justice system, and inadequate access to healthcare that of course has been exacerbated by COVID-19, the pandemic. So while there's been an investment in the tourist core, allocating more resources for improvements, maintenance and infrastructure, dispatching police patrols, that has come at the expense of other predominantly black low income neighborhoods. What we see is a clear spatial differentiation. Black residents who live in those areas are relegated to low paying service sector jobs, a prison industrial complex um, that they have the most interaction with, with the highest rates of incarceration in the world, a, vi a violent environment in a city that is notorious and consistently ranked among the highest in the nation in per capita homicides, and we see in the contemporary city some comparisons with slavery as it existed in New Orleans. I mean, we have the situation in which in the tourist core, there is some interaction. In New Orleans, slavery was different in, than the plantation system where there was proximity between enslaved people and slave owners. And while there was geographic proximity there was not you know, even intimate in the physical space, but they were very distant and unequal socially. The irony is that New Orleans is more racially segregated than at any other time in its history, including slavery now. So because of a series of developments that have their roots in the mid 20th century, but that were certainly exacerbated after Hurricane Katrina, disinvestment, gentrification, the demolition of public housing, rising housing costs. Tourism has certainly contributed to the separate and unequal housing patterns that we see now in the city. So just as I look at the legacies of slavery in the tourism industry that diminish Black life or deny Black history, there's also a legacy of slavery in the resistance and cultural and community resilience that sustains Black New Orleans. And that type of resistance and agency is a vital part of the story. Disaster tour, tourism, many of you may remember that erupted in New Orleans in the months after Hurricane Katrina hit that really sought to profit off of the spatial differentiation. But we see examples, um, countless examples of communities that resisted being a spectacle, that demanded in countless ways an acknowledgement of their humanity, an acknowledgement both of the people who died to recognize that, that loss, but also a demand to acknowledge the people who were still living. And that is one of the reasons why I'm very excited to think about 
that kind of legacy in the project that I am taking on now. Um, the tour guide that I'm working on with Elizabeth Steeby, who's at University of New Orleans, highlights histories and sites of resistance. Um, it's a collaborative process. We're looking at grassroots um, activism. I'm going to try to link to the website. And the, there's a website that includes a few sample sites and I'll point to some of those, but if you have time, you can take a closer look at some of these sites. The, um, we have a wonderful advisory board that we are working with. Luisa Dantas, a writer, director, and filmmaker. Queen Cherise Harrison Nelson, artist, educator, big queen of the Guardians of the Flame, Mardi Gras Indians. Dillard University's own Dr. Amy Lesson, um, an environmentalist and biologist doing research on health disparities. Catherine Mickna, a humanities teacher and scholar, a student-centered Did I? Um, Catherine Mickna, who's um, a student-centered pedagogue, Molly Mitchell, the director of the Midlow Center for New Orleans Studies at University of New Orleans, French Quarter Frank Perez, who's a tour guide and a historian. I think he may even be a tarot card reader. Dr. Kim Vaz Deville at Xavier University, who's a scholar and practitioner of baby doll culture, and Leon Waters. Um, one of the founders of Hidden History Tours and the chairman of the Louisiana Museum of African American History. So together, we are foregrounding community-based work and see this as a powerful alternative to a tourism industry that I critique and desire and disaster New Orleans. Our goals are to reorient the tourist gaze, to expand the tourist landscape and imaginary beyond the traditional tourist core, to highlight sites of resistance by marginalized groups not typically included in mainstream narratives, but also to reinterpret existing sites so that they are more inclusive of histories that center on African Americans and women and people of color and queer folk and grassroots activists to incorporate neighborhoods that have been undervalued and under-resourced. We know that the city's geography has been produced by historical patterns of settler colonialism, slavery, environmental racism, gentrification, and segregation. So it's important that we take a look at the grassroots activists that have fought valiantly to disrupt these historical patterns and their contemporary legacies. So I just wanna look at a few of the sites that will be included in a people's guide when it's published. One is, tells the story of Set Mallow Maroon Colony. And from 1780 to 1784, Set Mallow became the Spanish colony's most notorious maroon or cimarron after establishing a territory for fugitive slaves at Ville Gaillard in present day St. Bernard Parish. His territory stretched from the Wrigley's in present day New Orleans East to Lake Bourne, along the canals and bayous connecting Lake Pontchartrain, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Mississippi River. And this area encompasses the present day site of Bayou Sauvage National Wildlife Refuge. Then that's what the photograph, you know, one of our photographers, Don Jefferson, captures in this slide. Say Malo. Um, reportedly issued the warning, woe betide the white man who crosses these bounds. And when several white Americans attempted to capture him and fellow Maroons to return them to slavery in 1783, Sam killed one man and rescued his compatriots. He later confessed his role in killing four white Englishmen and commandeering their provisions. After several raids on his encampment by colonial authorities, he was eventually captured and tortured 
and sentenced to a public hanging in Plaza de Armas, which is today called Jackson Square. That was in 1784. But you know, this story is important for looking at the alternative and uh, to the slave society, the opposition to slave society that the Maroons offer, and that connects New Orleans to other New World communities where runaways preserved their language and culture and crafted something to of a stark contrast to the depiction of enslaved people as singing and dancing and enjoying themselves as the Gambina dolls depicted. Another site is the Cabildo, and this may be a familiar site, but in our tour guide, Leon Waters, who does, um, who's written a book and has done extensive work on the 1811 slave uprising, presents this story to talk about the Cabildo being the target for that slave uprising, the largest in US history. The Cabildo was the seat of municipal government in colonial New Orleans, and it derived and dispensed its power from its function as a slave depot where Africans were sold outside to settle debts and close successions. The enslavement, dehumanization, sexual exploitation, and violent repression of Afro-Louisianans and other vulnerable populations are not subordinate elements of New Orleans history, but foundational to the city's emergence, development, and advancement, and of course, to its wealth. Another entry in the guidebook is the Press Street Railroad Yards. And as you can see by the marker, this is the site where Homer Plessy in 1892 at age 30, the, he was a shoemaker and public education reformer. He was arrested shortly after he boarded an East Louisiana railroad train bound for Covington, Louisiana. And this was an intentional effort to violate Louisiana's 1890 Separate Car Act, which required the segregation of railroad companies and railroad cars. And black and white passengers were forced to enter cars designated for their race. So Plessy's act of civil disobedience was part of a well-orchestrated legal campaign led by some of New Orleans' um, top educated male elite and supported by the Black community at large. They relied on the Black press and civil rights organizations such as Le Comité des Citoyens to level a legal challenge to the Separate Car Act and to secure the rights granted to African Americans by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution. But this also drew on a longer history that African Americans in the 1860s through, um, you know, emboldened by their military service, emboldened by the fact that they were self-emancipating before the Confederacy even surrendered, that they had freed themselves and employed civil disobedience, violent resistance and litigation. And this was a cross-class effort that effectively and successfully desegregated streetcars in 1867. And then to go backward, but also forward into the history to see how that resistance continues. The reason that, or a large part of the reason why we have a marker and our advisory board member, Catherine Mickner writes about this, but this marker commemorating this pivotal episode and the national civil rights struggle. This is recent. This was only put here in 2009 and largely because of the efforts of the Frederick Douglass Community Coalition, a grassroots network of community arts, education, and social justice organizations. And central to this group has been the work of students at the center, a high school writing and community storytelling program. This, of course, is Armstrong Park. In the 1950s to the 1970s, the city of New Orleans raised almost 10 blocks of the Treme neighborhood, neighborhood, demolishing 
um, historic 19th century buildings displacing 178 families or about a thousand people who lost their homes and businesses. Um, and many of the institutions that had helped to nurture jazz and Afro-Creole culture, all for a proposed cultural complex that was never built. So I know I've been keeping up or trying to keep up with some of the debates that have been going on in response to the city's most recent proposal to move City Hall into Armstrong Park. So thinking about that in the context of this history, in 1980, Lewis Armstrong Park was built on that vacant land. And although the park was promoted as a tribute to the legendary jazz trumpeter, many of those city leaders and urban planners and preservationists did not recognize the architectural and cultural value of that mostly black and poor neighborhood at the time. Instead, they saw this area as an investment opportunity and proposed development projects to attract tourists and bring in revenue. So if they had their way, this flashy entrance arch at the beginning of the, the parks entrance, that would have led to a fee-based amusement park and entertainment district. But Treme residents and community activists saw the neighborhood as a center of black culture, not just for New Orleans, but for the entire country. So they fought against further destruction of the neighborhood and demanded restitution for the earlier displacement of Treme residents. They were led by the Treme Community Improvement Association. They rejected the idea of admissions fees that would limit the access of neighborhood children and successfully lobbied for greater community input into development and management of the park. They wanted designs in the park to honor the neighborhood's history of black resistance and cultural creativity. And as a result, the city scrapped its plans for privatization of the park and agreed to employ Treme residents and to build the Treme Community Center, this multi-million dollar recreation center, which was renovated again after Katrina and is located just outside of the park. And the last um, slide from the book that I'll share comes from um, Professor Amy Lesson's work on the Bayou Bienvenue wetland platform, which was built in 2008. And this was a partnership between residents and environmental and social justice organizations, as well as universities to provide information about the history of the area's ecosystem and the importance of wetland preservation. This area had been a freshwater um, habitat for diverse wildlife and vegetation and a source of sustenance and recreation for the Ninth Ward community. It was also a natural buffer against storm surges and flooding until the shipping channel, which we knew familiarly as Mr. Go, was cut through it in 1968. And the shipping channel was really an economic failure, but it did succeed in destroying the Cypress Swamp and acting as a funnel for Hurricane Katrina's storm surge inundating the Lower Ninth Ward and St. Bernard Parish. But residents filed a lawsuit against the Corps of Engineers because of that damage and under pressure from a coalition of opponents, the waterway was closed in 2009 and a surge barrier was erected in 2013. Bayou Bienvenue is now part of state and federal coastal restoration plans because of this type of coalitional advocacy. And of course, there are even more recent efforts in the city that demonstrate the legacy of resistance and resilience. Uh, maybe most famously, the 2017 um, removal of the monument, the four monuments honoring the, the Confederacy. And this movement, um, led in large part by Take Em Down NOLA, gained inspiration and mentorship. It really built on the work done by other activists who had worked for decades to remove the slaveholders' names from public schools. So we see how that kind of legacy um, continues. I think that Take Em Down NOLA has effectively articulated the relationship between these symbols, these monuments uh, to white supremacy and the systems of white supremacy. 
drawing a link, for instance, between the prominence of Andrew Jackson and Jackson Square for the city's most lucrative tourist, the most lucrative industry, and Jackson's history of slave owning and Indian removal policies. The way that the history and the policies that we are paying homage to and the contemporary manifestations of those policies get acted out. So the movement is not just about dismantling the statues, but is about dismantling white supremacy itself. And tonight I've provided some examples of the sanitized and exploitative tourism from above represented by the plantation tours and the mammy figures and servant dolls. But I also hope I've given us a way to imagine a more participatory and maybe even abolitionist tourism from below that highlights the reciprocal relationship between symbolic and structural violence and the necessity for spatial and social justice. Thank you. And thank you for your patience during all of the technical glitches. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. That was a brilliant lecture. Uh, everything you said resonated, I think, with a lot of us. And we do have a few questions, and we want to thank everyone for hanging in there with us, and we apologize for our, any technical difficulties once again. Uh, the first question is from Phil Katz. Uh, from the Council of Independent Colleges. And he had a question, uh, just curious, uh, did they also sell dolls representing a glamorous image of white enslavers? I have not come across those. Okay, thank you. And I then mean, maybe, maybe that's, not, that's not maybe altogether accurate. Those mm -hmm. would probably be the dolls that are the Scarlett O'Hara, mm -hmm. um, type of doll. So yes, those, I mean, I think those still proliferate that the imagery of Gone with the Wind so that the romance around that, right, does make its way into doll culture too. Absolutely, absolutely. And then we also have Korsha Wilson, uh, incredible writer. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we encourage anyone else who has any questions or comments to please put their questions in the Q&A box uh, so we can continue this conversation. Oh, so, I, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I also have a question. I, I want to hear the one that you're about to say, but just for, for everyone, you know, I haven't been to New Orleans since before the pandemic. Mm. So I am curious to hear from you and you know what people are thinking about the future of tourism in this moment of crisis. Is there a way to envision a city that emerges from this that isn't so dependent on tourism? Are there alternatives that people are talking about or doing? Or is there some possibility for a different approach to tourism in the, the city? So I'd be interested to hear what people think about those. If you all could resonate on that, and I'll also give my feedback after we ask uh, the rest of the questions from uh, our attendees. But you know, please do um, put your comments on what uh, Dr. Thomas is asking New Orleans residents who are participating this evening. So Korsha Wilson asked, uh, this is a fan, she first she said, this is a fantastic conversation. I'm curious if Dr. Thomas is familiar with the current anti-tourism movement in Hawaii and how locals there have pushed back against visitors sidestepping colonialism while there. Can New Orleans and other cities that are part of the history of the transatlantic slave trade in the United States replicate that or do their specific histories prohibit that? I, I think I am um, familiar, or, or maybe I shouldn't say I'm familiar with the anti-tourism um, movement, but I am familiar with the efforts to decolonize tourism mm. so that there are a lot of Hawaiians who are like us, uh, you know, an economy that's dependent on tourism, but is trying to do it on their own terms. And that does mean that sometimes everything isn't available and accessible to tourists, that it really is 
building on this idea of being invited to being a guest in somebody's home, not just going in and taking over. So there's some spaces where tourists are not welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a way too of this more grassroots approach for local people to take ownership in different ways of the, the tourism industry. So, I mean, I think it does involve some elements of anti-tourism, but also decolonizing it. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And Asali, who is the executive director of Ashe Cultural Center, thank you for uh, joining us. She stated that there are international models for sustainable tourism and cultural equity policies that we should be examining and testing here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I will discuss that further, uh, but I wanted to ask one, one more uh, question from our uh, participants. And thank you for saying that, Asali. We do need to look at that. Um, are any tour companies who give tours at plantations taking steps to give a more realistic view of slavery? I mean, I think the, the most famous example is um, Whitney Plantation, which probably many people have gone to. In my book, the, I, th I think they've had so many fires, I don't even know if it still exists or exists in the same way, but Laura Plantation on the River Road was one at the time. And, you know, again, I'm not sure with recent developments since there have been at least rhetoric. I'm sorry, are you muted? Yes, I can, we can hear you. Go okay. ahead. Uh huh. I'm just muted myself. That's all. Okay. I'm talking. So the um, I was gonna say I'm not sure what people are doing, or at least claiming they're doing, because this is the, you know, the, the moment when everyone is at least in some performative way, claiming to um, be doing some work on racial justice or anti-racism. So I'm not um sure what other um, plantations are doing. And I think there have been, it's been a while since I've been to, to Whitney Plantation. Um, there have been a lot of people who critiqued it in, in different ways, but it, it was at least making the effort to present a different view of slavery that wasn't about the glamor and the, the chandelier and the absence of slavery, you know, all of this wealth and opulence, but somehow making invisible the labor that created that and that made it possible and the exploitation that made it possible. Then, thank you for sharing that. And then we have another question. Well, just to, you know, circle back on something, uh, the question that Phil asked about the dolls. He said, as an addendum to my earlier question, I now see the parallel between presenting slaves without masters, the servant dolls, et cetera, and masters without slaves, the statues removed from NOLA. So thank you for um, that addendum. Mm -hmm. And then just to um, Leon, Dr. Leon, Leon Waters is with us. Hi, um, Mr. Leon. <laughs> We love Miss Leon, and um, the Phil also uh, said the ecological impact of tourism is a real issue. For example, Venice, Italy, and overlaps with histories of inequality. So, if you want to continue with that, and then we have one last comment. Could you repeat that again? Yes. Yeah. Was there... He's he made the uh, comparison between what's happened, the ecological impact of tourism is a real issue, considering you know for example Venice, Italy, and it overlaps with histories of inequality. Right, I mean, yes, we're definitely seeing that in southern Louisiana, but I also like making the connection to other places, to Venice and other parts of the world you know, again, pushing back against this idea that New Orleans is somehow exceptional. Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw how in some ways, Hurricane Ida did more damage in the Northeast, here in the Northeast than it did even in Southern Louisiana, or at least the, the death toll was initially higher because, you know, New Orleans is, is, is often the case is pointing the way that we all are headed 
not that it's the only one going in that direction. And, you know, what Katrina did was a lot of things that were in progress were accelerated, but those are things that are happening all over the country and increasingly um, around the world. As another Selena Cuff asks, what can we do to bring more black owned businesses at scale, 500 million to a billion to NOLA? Selena, Ms. Yes. Cuff, I, I don't. Selena is, <laughs> Selena is an incredible uh, black uh, female entrepreneur and has uh, wine companies, a wine company wow. in South Africa. And she's also the director um, and forgive me if I don't say the title correctly, but she's the director of um, of Magic Sodexo under uh, Magic Johnson. Okay. Uh, so, you know, she's asking as far as just how do we, I think. I mean, I, feel, I mean, I'm not, I think it's a great question, but I feel like she's probably in a better position to answer that what you just described in terms of what she's been doing. I'd love to hear what she has to say. Yes. in terms of what has helped to promote her success. Yes. I mean, maybe those are some things that could be replicated yes. as well as some of the impediments that, you know, have made it difficult that she has been able to achieve in spite of or could be doing better if it were not for that. Well, this is such a great conversation because, I mean, and forgive me, Selena, you are the president of Sodexo Magic, and she also, and her roots are definitely in Louisiana. She has visited us um, so many times and been a huge supporter of uh, the Ray Charles program, so we appreciate her being here this evening as well as everyone else. So this is hopefully will, you know, this is what we also wanted to do with the Legacies of American Slavery Project. And this can open up to conversation and us networking and figuring out ways to actually make um, something happen out of this. And hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll give each other contacts and be able to connect with each other. Asali as well, um, Baba Leon, everyone um, on here are, you know, a lot of thinkers and Phil and, you know, other people who are joining us um, in other cities as well are all thinkers and trying to figure out what's going to happen in this millennial era uh, where we are dealing with such ecological um, disasters and trying to figure out how do we maintain and preserve culture that is equitable. So um, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Thomas, also the people's guide to um, the, the website that you discuss. So another one, uh, JB Border said cooperatively owned hotels, restaurants, food and transportation suppliers have to be necessary steps in the evolution to the equity that we are willing to work. We are all working to achieve in the 21st century throughout the global black world. Fascinating. Right. I mean, that's the, you know, even, I'm not in the, the business world, but those same principles, the cooperative approach, the bringing resources together, thinking about different forms of, or looking different places from forms of knowledge and expertise, like these seem to be important. And that really require a re-envisioning or a restructuring of these system at, you know, these systems as we know them. So thinking about it, um, creatively and right. It, it may mean overhauling some things or doing things very differently. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, we at Dillard University, you know, we're always trying to train up the next urban planners, the next politicians, filmmakers, cultural bearers, et cetera. And, you know, we're excited to have these conference, these conversations once we have our regional conference for the legacies of American slavery. And we invite you all once we announce it, uh, we're still trying to figure out how, when we're gonna announce it just with COVID. Uh, so, you know, we're excited to have all of these uh, conversations and we invite Dr. Thomas to also come, you know, back home and, you know, have these conversations and join us in this effort. Um, and we thank everyone for joining us this evening. If you have any other questions or comments, you could always email me directly. And I can always, if, if Dr. Thomas allows us to share her information, 
uh, we will definitely uh, share that with you. And we want to keep this conversation going. And we hope that you also purchase her book because I read it and it is, um, you know, profound. And she is doing incredible work. And, you know, we love that she's also still keeping her foot in New Orleans and her expertise and her research. And, you know, New Orleans never leaves you. So we just want to say that. <laughs> so we thank you all for joining us. I also shared a link. Uh, if you, I'm going to share it one more time. But if you have a few more minutes where you want to stay on here, I can play the, uh, oh, thank you, Dr. Adderley. That, oh, that's Roseanne Adderley. Best you. book ever written about the city. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So we are so honored and humbled to have you, Dr. Thomas, and back at Dillard, just, you know, sharing all of this research that you have done. So we are so grateful for thank this opportunity. For and we thank the Council of Independent Colleges. Please also, um, we, you know, if we will share, figure out a way, Phil, if we could possibly share with, uh, you know, our participants tonight, other uh, activities that are going on with other universities, because this is actually a project uh, that, a multi-year project, and it, about seven, I'm gonna share the link, Phil, if you could possibly share the link, that would be great. Um, we're about seven, I think, universities are um, part of this, and each one of us are doing specific themes. So our theme that we're focusing on at Dillard University is culture creativity, and we're doing food, um, music, and tourism. So you will see a lot of activities in the following years looking at the legacies of American slavery with food, music, and tourism. And... Thank you. Thank you, Phil. So you all can click on that link that Phil just um, sent and you can learn more about the legacies of American slavery and the universities that uh, were selected. It was a very, um, you know, um, competitive and, you know, well thought out process for us to get this. Um, so we are excited to get this grant and really delve into the legacies of American slavery and have these conversations and definitely open it up to our students, the public and the community and nationwide, because we have to do this work. We have to continue to do this work, right? So thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you so, so, so much. And we will, you know, I will play if you, if people want to stay, you can, you know, leave if you want, but I can share my screen and then I will play the, um, the short film. We have a, a film series also that we've launching and we partnered with a couple of our Dillard University students. Thank you, Sharice, for being here. One of our amazing uh, students, film students, uh, who also was a camera person, on this uh, film series. So we are, um, I'm gonna go ahead and play it. And it is with the founder and director, uh, Giovanna Joseph of the Opera Creole. And she's talking about the legacies of American slavery uh, with music. So if you have time, you know, Dr. Thomas, you, you don't have to stay on if you don't want. I know we had until about 7.30. Uh, you know, if you want to stay on, you can, or anybody else, but I just wanted to put that out there so you all just see this uh, piece with us, and since we have our students on, I know that's something that they would want to share. <laughs> Is that okay? Yes. Okay, and Thank you once again, Dr. Thomas, for your incredible presentation. This is just phenomenal. Um, and we you. hope to continue this conversation with you. Thank you so much. It's always great to be home, e even virtually. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And what, you know, I, I, um, I know you've shared, when, when will the book come out? The next, um, do you have an idea? Mm -hmm. I, I, we don't have a, a date yet. We've had a, a few setbacks because of you know everything right right i understand but, yeah but we are you know getting as much work done as, as we can yeah but, you know because that's the thing about having a collaborative project and sure. we have all these people we're working with and we just have to have some grace with each other and ourselves during some very difficult times 
Absolutely. We all have to have grace with each other. And, you know, and it's such a pleasure also to kind of look at history and to see how our ancestors came over in very difficult times. So, you know, th- we're going through this, not something similar, but we're going through our own challenges right now. So we definitely have to have grace with each other. So we and, think you know, it's a, it's a wonderful project to be working on in the midst of all that, to have that. Absolutely. To, Absolutely. You know, help people get through some of these challenges oh it's a lot (laughs) absolutely thank you so much for this and we are excited to you know share once your project is done uh you know share it with uh everyone who's uh participating and being a part of this you know to share continue to share your work because you are so vital to this work thank you so much thank you okay i'm gonna go ahead and share my screen everyone Okay. And is there a way for me to hide myself or? I think so. Yeah, you just click stop video. Well, that didn't quite hide myself. Okay. If I, okay. It, Are you able to, you can I, always stop video and put yourself on mute. At the bottom, if you scroll down to the um, bottom, bar Yeah, I just want to make sure that you all can see my screen. I hope I'm doing this right. I'm still learning. This uh, what is my first webinar that I've actually hosted. So you all, y'all, please forgive me. I'm learning, teaching myself. Ah, we're all learning. So please have grace. Um, okay, not the desktop. Can anybody see my screen yet? Okay, if it's not playing, I apologize. Um, And I will just share the link and hope that you all watch it and please do comment and uh, let us know. Oh, you can see it, great, okay, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and play it then. Thank you. Okay, here's my screen. I hear music in the air. Over my head. The concept of people being lesser than, uh, people having um, less mental ability or creative ability, it's all a fallacy. And I am always so proud to see the accomplishments of my people, regardless to what they have been through. Um, and so I, there's so much, especially in New Orleans, has happened when it comes to music that we um, we don't talk about often enough. And the fact of, I, when I think of my great-great-grandmother, the fact that she went to church where they spoke French, that she spoke Creole at home, that she uh, had a, a person who she worked for who spoke English, and she was blind, and she had 13 children, and she negotiated all of that that we are an amazing people to, to manage difficulty and to get through difficulty. Well, New Orleans quickly became an opera mecca uh, in all of North America. If you did not perform in New Orleans, you were not a star, you were not a, uh, a noteworthy talent. And we produced our first opera here in 1796. And uh, from that time on, we had five opera houses and free people of color performed in the pits um, and they uh, were composers as well. Um, One of the stories that I like to tell 
at a point in uh, during Spanish rule, uh, because it was started by France and they continued it, the King of France said that on Sundays, this is a Catholic place. You cannot make the enslaved work on a Sunday. So that meant they had to fend for themselves on a Sunday. And that's where we see the Congo Square experience where they go and they've had a little plot of garden, they go and, and sell their wares and then there's music happening there in Congo Square. But those who had particular skills would hire themselves out if they were plasterers or iron workers or that sort of thing. And the money that they made, they saved to buy their freedom, but they also bought tickets to the opera. So we have historians that have come through and seen enslaved people walk in the streets of New Orleans singing operatic arias and said, what is this? <laughs> and so it was um, like the pop music of the time. It was well-loved. Um, and it was um, one of the things that I think really helped to save New Orleans because it wasn't in terms of weather and pestilence, it was not really a great place to live. And so um, having this culture brought into the city and that people can enjoy was one of the things that saved New Orleans in its early years. Um, but those who were trying... <clears throat> So my apologies, everyone. For some reason, I cannot um, share my screen. Uh, so I apologize for that. I tried to, to do a couple of things, but it doesn't seem to be uh, working. Um, let me see. Open. No, it's not working. Uh, so I apologize for that. So we I shared with everyone uh, the um, link that you can watch it on your own. So please do, um, you know, look at that uh, film. Did you address your preference settings? Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can possibly do that. Okay. This is coming up. Open system preferences. Okay. Let me see if I can open system preferences. Thank you. I really need to learn all of this. <laughs> uh, Okay, I think I'm just gonna just, you know, let it, everyone just watch it on their own. And for next time, we will definitely have another film. And uh, thank you for that, Tanya, I appreciate that. And I will definitely look into making sure that I, my um, settings are correct. So you can definitely watch it on your own. We thank you for joining us. And, you know, please do comment and, you know, share the video. We are so proud of our students. We thank you for joining us for a wonderful lecture with Dr. Thomas. And we look forward to, I'll share it one more one again. Okay, let me share it with participants. Here you go, everyone. We look forward to uh, our next lecture, which will be in November with Dr. Jessica Harris. We will announce that and, um, you know, on, and if you'd like to join our subscription list, you can always email me. This is my email. And uh, I will definitely send, add everyone who participated tonight uh, to our subscriber lift for our um, newsletter. So we will announce that in our newsletter for our next lecture with Dr. Jessica Harris. So thank you all for joining us this evening. We hope you all have a safe and lovely evening wherever you are. And for anyone in New Orleans, we are praying for you. Um, you know, as we go through this Hurricane Ida recovery, we pray that your homes are safe and, um, you know, that you recover soon mentally. Uh, as well as your home and physically and spiritually. So thank you so much. Thank you.